Hello, I'm Chris. I'm guessing you probably don't know who I am, but most people don't, so that's okay. What matters is the fact that you're listening, and for that I am grateful. I'm guessing you're now wondering what this is all about. Well, I'm beginning a project. I've been thinking about it for a couple months. The shadow of it has been sitting in the back of my mind for several years, and the motivations for it stretch a lifetime. Simply put, I am taking a journey to a deeper understanding of the things that matter to me and what I believe will be important to the world. There will be few constraints on the realms explored and the exact nature of the journey is not yet obvious to me. So, if you're inclined to travel to unknown places for unknown rewards, then maybe you could come with me down the long road. Hello, welcome to the long road. Hey, buddy. So, how are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Been good. a uh, good day, and now I get to talk to you. So, we'll finish with a good evening. Excellent. And I got some whiskey here, so you know it'll be all right. Even better. So, basically, I just want to jump right into, uh, you know, who you are, where you've come from, the lessons that you've learned from where you've come from. Yep. that sort of thing yeah so uh for those that don't know me um kyle young coach kyle with bookie strength and that's actually how i obviously you know this but people watching this may not um or listening to this um i met you at the gym here um probably actually before i worked officially yeah. with strength was a coach um but not officially on the, the roster and not an employee um and then after i took over as an employee we got to see each other on the gym floor a little bit, and then I took you on as, uh, as one of my athletes. So um, we've had uh, uh, quite a bit of, of history together. Um, is it, uh, yeah, it's got to be over two years now, yeah? Yeah, uh, June of 2018 is when we started. June of 2018, uh, made it through some fires, made it through COVID, um, got a barbecue together under our belt, and um, an international trip into uh, Ireland. So. Um, yeah. We know each other pretty well, but uh, going back more about me and how I got here, um, when I was, well, younger than you, um, you know, fitness was never a thing in my life, and I never thought that it would be. If I could go back to, like, 12 or 13-year-old Kyle, when uh, life took an a interesting turn um, for the worse, the way I look at it now, um, fitness wasn't a thing that I did. Um, I was pretty darn good at soccer growing up, um, but... Uh, they made me run too much, and I was being a hoodlum into smoking cigarettes and doing drugs, and I got tired of running, so I pretty much quit soccer because of that because it was more fun to hang out with homies. Um, was avidly into BMX, um, um, you know, dirt jumps and stunts, a little bit of street freestyle stuff too, but a um, uh, handful of injuries gave that up. Snow sports in Montana, so um, I guess it, it sounds a little more athletic, but, um, you know, no, no hopes or aspirations to be an athlete. Um, growing up in Montana, it's not like we have a great, uh, you know, wrestling program or football program. So yeah. it's really not known for it. it's, it's athletics. So um, I started getting into a lot of trouble when I was young, um, got kicked out of the public school system before I graduated eighth grade. So even if there was some hopes for, you know, high school football or whatever and getting a, um, you know, going to wrestling or, or anything like that and going on to college, you um, uh, you know, uh, for sports, I, I messed that up. I didn't have that opportunity. They no longer wanted me in the public school system. Um, mostly fighting and, and just being a knucklehead and not going to class and doing pretty much everything I could wrong. Um, was getting involved in drugs or already involved in, in drugs pretty heavily at that time, selling drugs. Never really got caught, so that had nothing to do with, um, you know, getting kicked out of school. Um, fast forward, uh, homeschooled a little bit but then just started and I, I always had a job you know since gosh um, when I was young working for my dad's electrical company um, but you know 12 13 14 15 
um, had a job, moved out from my parents' house when I was uh, 15 after getting here in, a, in an argument or multiple arguments with the parents. I just thought I could do it better on my own. Um, had a full-time job, then two full-time jobs, um, and supplemented my income by being a knucklehead and, and selling drugs. By the time I was uh, 18, um, I was almost wrapped up with that, but unfortunately, too much damage had been done. I was involved with trafficking drugs from out of state, so the the FBI knew who I was and had an open FBI case. Um, I quit everything, moved out of state by the time I was 19, 20-ish, tried a couple times to give it up, but I wasn't ready, right? I wasn't ready to make that change. So... Um, 20-ish, I think was the last time, yeah, about 20 years old was the last time I moved to uh, to Oregon. Um, and my dad offered me some help one more time, moved out here, uh, got the good old GED, um, uh, paid off some fines, got my driver's license back from warrants, all that good stuff, right? So try to do things right. He bought a house and we started remodeling it, so getting into construction, was really doing my best to be you know, clean and sober and do things right. And unfortunately, because my case was uh, through, um, uh, you know, the, the DEA, essentially, um, they have a charge that's the conspiracy charge, and you can never have possession of anything, um, you know, no wire buys, no selling to informants, anything like that that they had proof of other than hearsay. And the, the case went down from top to bottom. I was out of state two years later and still got wrapped up on it and was looking at uh, five to ten years in federal prison. Um, never, I had some youth charges, but you know, never had a, any felonies or anything else. So right out of the gate, went from um, you know, uh, no incarceration time to going directly to federal prison at the age of 2021. 20, Not a very exciting prospect. Now, given at the time, I weigh a total of 135 pounds, probably um, at the same height that I am right now at 210. Um, and you know, drug use, things like that, was not good choices. So I go to federal prison and there's a bunch of way hardened criminals, way more tough than I was, even though I thought I was a tough little guy. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience. So uh, that's really where I kind of started working out and training and falling in love with fitness. Got involved with martial arts right before I got locked up, but it was a short stint. Um, so it, uh, it was a challenge. And you know I saw so many people that were you know, just way farther off than me. Um, you know, deep down, deep down in a dark place that are never going to or never want to get out of that incarcerated life. And I had friends before I got locked up that were, you know, plenty hardened, if you will, as well. So I don't know what it actually was, but, you know, looking around at people, I had a choice to make. There's a big crossroads, right? We talked about long road earlier. Yeah. There was a long road no matter which way I choose, left or right. Yeah. Either right, and I can try to be that oddball and do something right and have a good life and make amends with my family and actually give back to this place, this earth, this society, or I can just go all in and I might as well get my face tattooed and, you know, just pick a fight with every big dude and just, let's just see how tough I can be. Cause yeah. I think youngster. And uh, I see that pop out occasionally still. What's that? I said, I, I see that pop out occasionally still. No, no, not with me. I swear. <laughs> now you know more about it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I made a choice and it was not easy. It was much harder to do that than it was to be, uh, you know, a knucklehead and go all in. Our, uh, I've never been incarcerated in other countries, obviously, so I don't know what other countries do well. You hear some of them do better than others. I uh, hear Canada is okay. Um, parts of, you know, Northern Europe have some pretty progressive things that sound smart to me. Um, uh, More Central re America rehabilitation than punishment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, South America sounds horrible, um, but I can tell you, <laughs> it's not great either. And you make that point. It's not about rehabilitation, whatsoever. It's really not. And um, I don't know if that's because the majority of the people they have inside don't want it. So there's really no point to make these robust programs. I don't know. But yeah. I can tell you, you want to go to school and get a college uh, uh, education and get in a trades program and other things, they make it really, really hard. Like you're waiting years to do things. Some of the stories I can tell you later on are, are just crazy, but not the point of this, this conversation. It's just very difficult. It's easier to be a knucklehead than it is to get uh, you know, a couple college classes, which yeah. blew my mind. 
so I took everything though. I studied books. My family sent me books. I, I read, I trained, I started working out with some, some really good uh, people, um, a few of which rarely, but I, I still stay in contact with today. Most everybody I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't talk to if I had to. Um, went through their short drug program, their long drug program, went through uh, their residential treatment program, which is in a different uh, housing unit, if you will, um, nine months intensive, you're in classrooms, you know, uh, 40 some hours a week. And that's still like the rate of recidivism is huge. Most people still don't make it, you know, anywhere off of that. Um, uh, fast forward, got out, uh, more hoops you have to jump through, can't get a job from, from anywhere. Made a couple lucky breaks, and uh, for whatever reason, I don't remember if there was a problem with it or not, but when you're in halfway house custody and early on parole, I couldn't get a job in the gym. Huh. They won't let you. It makes no sense. So when yeah. you're in halfway house custody, you know, um, I was working out. I was fit. I was a little guy, but I was fit. Um, had started training and all kinds of other stuff. Had a bunch of uh, recreation hours, you know, as a volunteer in the rec hall and all kinds of stuff. So, like, I'm trained fit to do this job, to, to start a career as a personal trainer. Yeah. No. What do you mean, no? <laughs> no. So, got into some sales, did some other things, um, and there was a couple hiccups along the way. You know, nothing necessarily I did, just missing an appointment or two, and almost got sent back um, just from missing an appointment while I was trying to do a second job at work. So again, my chips are just stacked against trying to prove you're doing something wrong. Um, finally got a job at a gym as a trainer when I was doing sales and other stuff. Uh, years later, took over as a fitness manager. Years later, took over as a club manager. During this whole time, I'm training uh, to get my black belt in martial arts. Things just start to snowball great. That's, that's one question I, I, I've had for a while now. Um, that I just never really gotten around to asking what, uh, because I know you've done some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but the, yep. the kickboxing that you did, what actual like school is that that you went to? Yeah, so we did a, a couple different types of kickboxing. Um, as far as, you know, you got your Dutch, you got your bang system. We studied mostly from a bang Muay Thai system, mm. Dwayne Ludwig, but it was here in Portland at my actual school where I used to teach. So, uh, the uh, former Academy of Kung Fu, um, and then all of our systems were named Kung Fu. And we weren't really a Kung Fu style; we're actually more of an offshoot off of uh, Kaji Kempo. And then the but, US, uh, and then the USC started, and everyone realized that most Kung Fu was BS. And then you rebranded, huh? Yeah, more or less. Um, actually, you know, when when the system came out in the '80s, Kung Fu was the, the thing. You know, prior to that, it might have been Taekwondo. So um, we did have some Kung Fu roots, but we weren't traditional Kung Fu. Uh, we're more of a street uh, mixed martial arts is the way I'd explain it to people who don't know. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they, we, we realized that uh, Kung Fu wasn't the, the fanciest name anymore that it used to be. So then the school's name changed to Southeast Portland Martial Arts um, because it was trying to be more of that encompassing center. Um, we were going to partner up with uh, one of our jiu-jitsu schools in town, which uh, my instructor and I had trained at. Um, and bringing some kickboxing and other things. So, um, yeah, and, you know, along those lines, that's there were still a lot of challenges, but things really started to snowball. And that's my, my takeaway from this message. A lot of times I don't even like to uh, talk about the past. Um, I was just talking to some people last weekend about this. Sometimes I feel like, I, and maybe it's just my misconception, but if I tell more stories about the stuff that I did that got me in prison, I feel like I'm bragging. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't because I don't even like to talk about it. I was an idiot. I, I did a bunch of dumb stuff. Heard a bunch of bad. You know, heard a bunch of good people. Um, I'm lucky to be alive. Um, and, you know, you hear that from a lot of people who have backgrounds like me. Sometimes, like I don't know, would you? Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to be here multiple times. You know, and yeah. so I don't like to talk, you know, too much in depth about it because it's, you know, sad, depressing shit. But at the same point in time, I don't want to make it sound like I brag about it. Yeah. And then on the flip side, where we're talking about how we got there. I don't like to uh, to brag too much either, but um, I have had the opportunity to go back to prison and speak to the inmates. I was on the mentorship program in my uh, for the parole uh, place because I, I did you know so well, and they couldn't believe it. They always ask like, "What are you doing? Like, how come you're not in trouble? Why aren't you doing drugs? Why aren't you failing p tests? You're not like other people." 
Well, I lift weights and I go punch people in the face. Yeah. Like all of my free time, if I'm angry, I go fight. I'm yeah. not going to fight a dude in a bar because I'm not going to be in a bar. I'm going to go fight where it's fair to fight and I'm going to learn how to control my aggression. Um, yeah. Powerlifting and martial arts for me were just a blessing of the, the blend of the two. The only time life got rough is when I was injured and I couldn't do one of them or both of them. Then I'd get depressed. And it's usually like, if I can't walk right because I tore a muscle or, you know, broke a bone, well, I can't squat and I can't fight. So now I'm just mad. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, speaking with the, the parole board, we went through uh, the drug program inside. I got admitted to a program that was pioneered, I think, actually here in Oregon for federal offenders, the residential or the, the reentry court. So they take people with, uh, you know, fairly serious crimes, has to be federal, and you have to have uh, drug issues with it. And you go through more intensive drug treatment and extra P tests, extra counseling, all this. And surprisingly, you know, I got to see a lot of people get locked back up. And some of the stories I would hear from these people and explanations they would give the judge that we had to see once a month in our parole officer and these people are trying to help was ridiculous. Again, I'll save the stories, but you can just imagine some of the dumbest stories about why somebody was caught with cocaine in their pocket or something silly like it's a friends. Like, there's no excuse of how it got in your pocket. Just own it. Yeah. It didn't just jump in there by itself. And, you know, they're asking me how I did well because traditionally you go to your AA and your drug programs and things like this and you go to church and whatnot. At the time, um, I was I got fairly religious when I was uh, incarcerated, but the time wasn't going to church or anything. And I told them, you know, my, my sanctuary is the gym. So... Yeah. What's keeping me safe and what's keeping society safe from me is I get to lift and I get to fight. Yeah. And then I don't go do this knucklehead stuff. And the last time I went back and spoke, it was, gosh, about two years ago. I need to go back again, but, you know, COVID and whatnot. Um, <laughs> I thought know, about that it. Whole thing. Yeah, that whole thing. And this is the message that I had for, for I think, if I had to recap, um, you know, my long road and how it was successful is too many people that get involved in you know uh bad stuff whether you know drugs gangs violence whatever the case may be um some of them are actually really intelligent uh, oh yeah oh now, yeah i didn't finish eighth grade um now i've educated myself a lot since then. as far as traditional um you know education i didn't have that experience at that time um and most people when i tell that to are surprised I was on the road talking to uh, a guy in a, a pretty high level college and he asked me where my you know where I did my doctorate at. I'm like, I what? Don't. Where's, your, where's your masters? Where'd you get your where'd you get your undergrad? Yeah. And I was like, I self talked. Yeah. And he was blown away is like you speak and articulate so well to me and my colleagues, I thought for sure, you know, you had a master's in exercise physiology or something. Yeah. And, and again, I don't make, make it sound like I'm bragging. I have a real point to this. No, yeah. And and it's too many people, um, you know, you could take some of these, these you know, drug dealers or other people, myself even, if I had a different opportunities in a different state um, and I was mentored into business or powerlifting or fighting or something else, maybe I could have been a hell of an athlete. I don't know. Maybe um, I was very successful running a multi-million dollar company with no real experience, just all self-taught. Maybe I could have, you know, been running a Fortune 500 company if I went through the right, you know, business Ivy League schools. I don't know. Yeah. And that's really not my point. My point is, you have a very, uh, you have a bunch of very driven, smart people. Even you know, a lot of people that uh, have ended up incarcerated, particularly when I'm talking about for for drug issues, they go to the the ends of the world, the depths of everything to find every way to either sell drugs or get drugs. Yes. They're more dedicated at that than most people are at anything in their life. And yes, there's addiction problems. But literally, if you take a minute and think about that, they're so dedicated, they'll do anything and everything. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a, it's a high, highly lucrative, highly risky business. So it's like either win big or go to prison, <laughs> it seems. Yeah. Or win big and go to prison. Exactly. So I thought one day, if I put as much energy into being a knucklehead, if I took that same energy and put it into doing something good, maybe I could get somewhere. And that's really when the thing started to turn. I'm just going to try as hard to educate myself 
as I did do X, Y, Z. So back to the last time I was there, it was cool because I sat there and I listened and it reminded me, I used to hate that drug court program because it was so annoying. I was around these people who didn't want to try and were, you know, showing up high, had Coke in their pocket. We're getting tested multiple times. Like we're the, the most red flag group out of everybody on parole. And listening to it, I just used to shake my head. Like how you guys aren't trying? So I stay away for a while. I do my thing. I'm successful. I'll go back to prison and talk. This is the second time back there. And I drove up in my car and I just had my, uh, I just paid off my Lexus. Um, you know, I had bought a couple cars before working on my job, but this is a car I bought brand new, pretty expensive Lexus, had it paid off, had a nice house at the time, um, had a good job, was successful, um, had got my black belt at this place that does not hand out black belts. So, you know, a, a, a very challenging place out of, you know, 30 years, we haven't handed out a lot of uh, a black belts. So very rare in itself, um, world record holder in powerlifting. Not an all-time world record, you know, um, probably lots of lifters listening to this. So, you know, it's one of those other things. Like, I don't like to brag too much because in our world, it's, you know, some people, if it's not an all-time world record, it doesn't matter. And I disagree with that. We've, we've had our favorite talk about that. Uh, yeah. It's right there. Always earned, never given. I'm yeah. going off on a tangent here, but, you yeah. know, to me, it was important. Um, you know, that was, I took something that said that was a national and then a world record that nobody else has. Is there stronger people than me? Hell yeah. That actually ties back into my story. So successful in business, successful in a, in a rare uh, fighting discipline, successful in powerlifting. And even if we get outside of the powerlifting world, the weights I was lifting to average people, you know, we're strong. <laughs> like, yeah, you laugh because it's funny. The weights that a powerlifter can lift in even an intermediate powerlifter is yeah. astronomical compared to the average male or female in the U.S. Yeah. So we're rare. And then to be on a... a ranked level or a world record level as you know yourself personally we start doing the math and we're like wow there's only like five people in the u.s that yeah. do it. so another level of uh, success and i sat there and i didn't know how to bring it to these guys and, and i hate it because one time i went back to uh, uh to prison to talk to guys and i had an on you know a nicer button-up shirt and uh we're talking to them and a lot of guys you just see kick back they're not paying yeah. attention they don't, like, they don't think you're one of them. Yep. So I pull up the sleeves and then I start telling them, yeah, you know, I had, I was arrested before I was 20 years old, spent most of my 20s in federal prison. All of a sudden guys start perking up. And it was the same thing. I walk in and they're like, hey, we have a returning graduate. And the people are just, you know, kind of whatever, don't want to pay attention. So I do the same thing, roll up the sleeves, tell them briefly how I got there. And then all of a sudden they're paying attention. And then I was kind of irritated. That's why I did it kind of cocky, but again not to sound you know um proud of my my mistakes or my successes but we probably should be a both i draw my keys on the counter or on the little you know banister aisle. i'm like i have a brand new lexus paid for outside and when i got out nobody would give me a job i you know am running a multi-million dollar fitness company and no formal education i am a world uh uh ranked uh, world record holder powerlifting I've got a black belt from this. I've done this, this, and this. Now, here's the caveat. Am I the smartest guy in the room? No, I guarantee I'm not. I've got 13 concussions. I've been hitting the head a lot. I can't type well. Um, sometimes I can't speak well. My brain goes faster than my mouth. I get frustrated. Am I the strongest guy? Oh, hell no, especially not in my weight class. I know that. There's guys from other federations that can come in and, and crush the world records that I have because they're not all time. Um, you know, so whether it's um, success in business or, or am I the toughest fighter? No, but I can hang. And something that I've told, you've probably heard this from me before, something I've told a lot of athletes is, you know, I'll keep winning because I'll keep showing up. And some of these younger guys or stronger guys that are in and out of powerlifting, they're in for yeah. a couple of years, they're so gifted and they leave. Well, yeah. guess what? Well, they, they don't that. leave. They pop yeah. off so fast that they break and quit over that right and and when we're talking the long road my point to all this to finish off where i've got is i thought about it and was like you know i'm just going to outwork everybody because i know i have more mental toughness than anybody i'm going to come in front of i know i'll outwork anybody that's in the same you know job category as me because they haven't been through what i've been through i'll just outwork them and that's how i'll be successful I may not be the toughest guy in the room fighting, but I'll keep coming back. And I will last longer than you and do more grit. You know, that doesn't make you stronger in powerlifting. But again, 
when other people are broken or they quit, I'm still going to be there. So I'm going to win that meet um, because I don't give up. So thinking the long road and and I didn't add that into, you know, the talk with this uh, this group. But I told them, if you tried as hard at starting your own business, whether it's a T-shirt company, a construction company, whatever it is, if you tried that hard as you did at trying to hide from the cops and do drugs and sell drugs or, or steal or whatever, you'd be so successful, blow your mind. Because you spend so much time and energy doing that. All you have to do is shift up here. Shift what you're thinking about. Use that same energy, that same drive you have, but do it for something good for once. And you'll be most more successful than probably 95% of Americans out there. So, yeah. Yeah. Long story short, that's, uh, that's how I got there and, uh, or, or where we're at today. Um, and I think it's really been true. Even, you know, I was just talking with uh, uh, my boss here tonight uh, about, uh, you know, looking for some other string coaches. And um, as our team grows and his experience and my experience on paper, I may not have been the best candidate ever, but I was here training with the team for years. I was helping Duffin. I was showing up. I was showing up to the seminars just like you and, and, and taking the education. I was always there. I was going to outwork anybody around me and show people that I wanted. I was hungry for that knowledge because I want to be able to give back. Um, and, and again, as we talked right before we started this help just one person, maybe not make the dumb choices I did because when I was making those choices, unfortunately, I didn't have lifting. Like when you found it at your age, I didn't have martial arts. I wish I would have, but I don't have any regrets because then I wouldn't be sitting here with this knowledge that I have. Yeah. Well, and I've I've talked to several people lately um, that are now highly successful, and it's interesting listening to them sometimes because they'll talk about you know oh, I did this that was dumb, and oh, I did that that was dumb. And I I understand that theoretically speaking, you could have had a better outcome, but one, can't change the past, so that's okay. And two, the lessons that you hopefully learned from that are probably pretty integral to the people that you are now. Yep. Uh, the last part is super true. I mean, um, you know, look how iron's forged, right? If you're a blacksmith or you're into sword making, right? It's got to be hot. It's got to be beat on. It's got to go through hell and back. And then you can have this super sharp, super beautiful object. Yeah. It wasn't an easy road to get there for that piece of steel. <laughs> it went, it got worked um, like a lot of us. Yeah. And it's true. Not saying everybody that's successful has had a challenging or hard life by any means, um, you know. But uh, thinking about Duffin's story, um, you know, that success drove him. Um, yeah. My story, it's driven me. Other people we can both know and we can think of, um, uh, you know, some of the stuff that Joe talks about that he's been through that drives him to be successful. Now that caveat, you have to be a strong person or strong mentally, or be able to flip the switch, right? Like I learned to do. Because yeah. if not, those things can just disrupt the person yeah. so i don't think that's the only thing that makes a successful person because they have to take that fire and run with it yeah um something that i've been thinking a lot about lately um have you uh do you know uh joseph joseph campbell's uh hero's journey uh not well it sounds familiar the name does not the hero's journey but yeah joseph. it's uh i believe I can't remember if that's the title of the book or if that is the book um, or if it's a concept in the book, but uh, basically it's just an outlaying of all hero myths share, I want to say, five or seven common elements uh, that are basically stepwise, you know. First you have the unknown hero, then they have a call to action, then they have, uh, I want to say the next one is some sort of defeat, and then they have a moment of growing, and then they have victory, and then they have a return to normalcy, but being changed from that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I'm sure I'm screwing that up. It, 
in terms don't of tell anybody exact. that i thought you had it down for sure that's how <laughs> even every second of this <laughs> even if it's off a little bit it's a really nice flow so it, uh, it makes sense but basically something that i've been thinking about is uh, like trying to reframe my underlying personal narrative as uh, as the hero's journey rather than I mean, whatever else, you know, victimhood or, or whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's a common element that I see in a lot of people who, you know, like you said, just flip that switch. It's like, it's that underlying narrative that all of a sudden they realize, like, you know, I might not be a hero, but I have to be my own hero. Um, and that's... I think something that not a lot of people realize and I think people like when I talk to people about it it resonates a lot with them yeah 100% I think uh, that should probably be brought up a lot more <clears throat> especially with today's social media age I know you're often <laughs> and it's it's funny because when you first said that I'm like I should make a post about you being on your own hero and now I'm going to tell people they shouldn't be on social media because they're following too many other people not being their own hero. So a little bit of uh, whatever with that. But uh, no, it's a, it's a really good message. And when I think back again, talking about how I was successful um, and, and I guess to some days uh, has helped me be strong with some of those around me is because I had to be my own hero. I didn't think about it like that. And it wasn't a choice that I had. Like I'm living in a shoebox, literally, with other dudes, I'm one of the youngest, tiniest dudes in this place. It's not cool. I don't like anything about this. There's nobody to look up to here, really, right? I don't have social media. I, I don't have, I get a letter that's, you know, two weeks old. It's been cut open and, and reread and crumbled up in an envelope and thrown under my door. Like, there's not that interaction. Who am I going to look up to around here? I need to be the best version of me every single day. And my goal was to be a little bit better than the day before. So if I had a bad day and I didn't want to go to the gym or I was depressed, well, okay, that day's a wash. But the next day, I don't have to go back to 100%. I just need to be a little bit better than I was yesterday. I need to keep trying. Um, so, yeah, interestingly, I, I think I was uh, a little bit of uh, my own hero, and I can see that now. And I think that's important nowadays, too, because, you know, you get on social media. And, um, everybody told, wants to be your hero, and everybody else is a hero to you. Yep. There's been some big lifters um, that aren't even they're close to me in in, in uh, category and, and whatnot but i'm not going to touch their numbers and i'm like that's just depressing yeah. yeah i don't even want to follow this person they're too good like this social media depresses me um and and even the reason i bring that up is being around duffin like you know he's not lifting like he used to and i talked to brandon about him like you got to step up and fill that role in the gym well i'm crazy you've seen me lift i'll go 110 percent. i like to lift angry and wild but um, I'm not doing that. Yeah. I hate to call myself short. I'm not trying to put a cap on myself, but he's a fucking monster and I'm not built like that. You know, <laughs> but me and Brandon, we really got to step up. And it's hard to step up in those shoes if we're not our own hero. Because I can look at that and be like, oh my God, I'll never do that. And I won't. I want to get closer than I am now. I want to do my best, but that's not in my cards. It's yeah. not. He's a freak and I'm not built like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, up, up in the 220 class now, obviously really light in 220s. But I'm like, oh, let's look at the state records and see how the duffing. Yeah, fuck, that's not going to happen. <laughs> better, better go back down to 198 or 181. Like, <laughs> it's cool that it's you know it's his and all. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know you've uh, you've got to be your own hero because there's always going to be something around you that whether it's social media or a bigger, stronger, smarter person um, that can be depressing and make somebody want to give up. Yeah. That actually, I took a few notes over the last week or so about things I wanted to talk about, uh, and that's actually one of the things sort of ties in about, um, I've had this idea in my head for a while about the difference between ambition and outcomes, and I think, I'm starting to think that ambition and outcomes have almost nothing to do with each other, <laughs> because... It's like, we all know those people that are like, oh, you work out, that's so awesome, I want to start working out. And then you're like, oh, cool, you could, you know, come to come to my home gym or, you know, get a membership and I'll come, you know, 
give you a few coaching sessions. And they're like, yeah, that'd be cool. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, and they're so passionate. They're like, that's so awesome. And then I'm like, awesome, let's do it. And they're like, yeah. (laughs) And it never happens. Yeah. Yep. And it's funny because, you know, I mean, you know almost better than anyone else. I've been busted up for close to a year and a half now. And, like, that really depressed me, especially, like, the first six months. Um, But I'm starting to not care if I ever get back in another competition. Like, I still love it just as much, but it wouldn't destroy who I am as a person if I never... And I think some of that is that hero's journey thing. It's like, that's this has been the only aspect in which I have been massively successful. Well, depends on who you ask, massively successful. But I feel massively successful. And so I've had a very hard time in the past translating that to other things because I I didn't understand the underlying concept all all I knew is that I felt good about myself when I lifted big weights (laughs) and that was about it but now that I understand about you know pushing myself and and the discipline required for it which by the way well actually let me circle back to that but the underlying personality and and skills required to do those things are translatable to far more than just this. It goes back to, you know, um, the long road or, or if we're going off this book, you know, talking about the hero's journey. And I've been there myself, like sitting here looking at some of these metals behind me. Um, I, I only have one metal hanger. I swear I've done more cool stuff. <laughs> Jokes aside, I have about the same amount at home, and um, I, uh, I I lost my both of my grandpas who were really close to me when I was incarcerated, um, which crushed me because I wanted to be there and I wanted to be better and I wanted to be there for the family and I couldn't. That was one of the hardest things about being locked up. So I took a gold medal um, from Worlds uh, that I had from the last time I won and uh, wrote a note to my grandpa back and went to visit his gravesite in uh, outside of Denver and uh, left it there on the gravesite. And it's not the best area of town. I remember it was my aunt or something. She's like, what are you doing? You can't do that. Some crackhead's going to take that. I'm like, well, one, it's not real gold. And two, I don't care even if it is because I left it there for them. And if they want that karma, they can take that. But it was really important. Like, what does it mean to me? It's just a metal, right? Um, and, and I wish I would have done more cool stuff and I'd have been active every year. I wish I was a better power lifter. But for me, again, it's part of giving back. I need to experience it. I need to be the part. But I have had, between your success, you know, the the rest of the Kabuki team, there's so many big medals and records and world records we won. It would fill the walls all the way around this room. Oh, yeah. And so for my long road, I know if I burn too hot, then my candle's going to burn out. And I'm the same thing getting my black belt. I achieved it very fast in our system. So did my instructor, but I probably could have got there six months to a year faster, but it would have been anything and everything. And I knew it was part of my longer journey, that hero's journey. So, um, you know, for you, I know you'll be on the platform again, but it's this really pivotal point you come to where I don't have to. It's not who defi- it's not what defines me. Yeah. I am now my own hero. It's not this. Uh, and you have done great stuff in your life. So I can see where other people might get on you for saying that. But it's it's really about. Um, you know, your it's, it, weightlifting is easy because it's tangible. I lifted X number of pounds. Yeah. It's a number and it's a bigger number than anybody else. And I got this cool gold medal because I beat everybody when I was done. That says I'm the best. I win. Those other things in life, stuff that you've overcame, um, you know, physically, mentally, there's not a tangible number on that. It's a feeling. And everybody knows how I feel about feelings. <laughs> at least with with lifting yeah. but it, that's why i think it's difficult because it's it that's what it is it's it's a feeling versus a i won metal i picked up heavy thing it's a number it's bigger than other people's numbers yeah. but if you never get back to that you still have the passion and the love um and that's what's important to it so do i wish i would have lifted more throughout all the years yeah of course 
but it's back to that I could never compete again as long as I get to live. Yeah. As long as I get to to get that out and, and be successful and be my own hero in the gym. Yeah. 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 Give me a sec. I was thinking about something related to that. What was it? I think it was, uh, oh, talking about, you know, success. I think a lot of people measure their own success in anything but how much it matters to them, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like, you know, how does, oh, I'm ranked number three. That means I'm, there's two more guys in the world that are better than me. And I've fallen back into this mindset so many times but I, I feel like I feel like it's important to realize that no matter what they're not going to be able to take away the fact that you did what it took to get to number three it's like even if even if you are only number three the person that you became getting there is far more important than the fact that you're number three. Yeah, especially when uh, you know we look at uh, what lifting is long term. We're kind of going on a tangent here, but again, talking long road. You know, if we don't have an an, uh, an end in sight, um, I always worry about athletes who only have numbers, and that's that's their entire world. Yeah. Like I don't care, man. Go pick up knitting. Like, go volunteer at the main society. You know. Have something else because at the end of the day, if you're broken and you have nothing else, which we've both been there before, it's super depressing because you have nothing yeah. and you're seeing everything slip away. Um, you know, it, it hit home when uh, I had AJ Roberts at my gym um, for the CrossFit powerlifting cert way back in the day, um, shortly after he left Westside Barbing. And I remember him telling me a story after he had the uh, you know all-time world record total when he was number one at the world when he in the world when he walked away of, of total all time so obviously by powerlifting the strongest man that there is and I can't remember what he squatted 11 something something like that and uh, he was telling me he was telling a stewardess on the, on the airplane you know yeah the world's strongest dude I squatted 1100 pounds and chick's like that's nice and walks away. Yeah. And dude's like, but it's 1,100 fucking pounds. Yeah. I'm number one. And same thing in a restaurant, talking to some people. You know, I'm, you know, I'm ranked here. Here's what the numbers and the weights that I lifted. Oh, that's nice. And you have that friend who had a friend in high school who squatted 700. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. There's a couple kids in high school who squat 700, and there's not a lot of them, so we all don't know one, okay? The leg press didn't count, and they didn't even put 700 on and quarter squatted because it would have snapped them in half. But my point to that is outside of lifting, that's where, you know, Chris has done a really good job. When he was in the limelight of, of you know, doing his thing on a day-to-day -day basis, of course, he was number one on Instagram. He was, you know, uh, you know, everybody's paying attention. Every new powerlifter knew that name. If you're a powerlifter right now, paying attention to the competitive powerlifters, and you've only you been in for no a year or two, who he is. you probably wouldn't know who he is yeah. outside of our company. And if his world would have been tied to only lifting – now that he's done, even with some of his big strength feats, he would just slowly disappear and have no presence. So he can't give and, uh, you know, back and help. So that long road is important, um, you know, defining our success, not just on numbers. Um, and I think a lot of pro athletes and lifters fall into that trap because they're so stuck in just their numbers, which is, don't get me wrong, I respect the, 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 oh, yeah. the hell out of it because yeah. they achieve things I can't and I'm probably not willing to do because I want to have success in other areas. Um, but it's impressive to what they do. But when it's done, that can be very depressive, depressing, like an injury. And then we, what do we have left? What are we dealing with? So that's not a, uh, it's a, it's a means to an end. It might be a, a fairly long road, but it's not, you know, a, a real long road of success and, and thriving once that's done. Yeah. We all can't be an Ed Cohen um, and have that many people know our name after we're done lifting and want to pay us to, to fly around the country to different cities to give us a, a quick seminar on how to squat and deadlift better, right? Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, if everyone was Ed Cohen, no one would be. Yeah. 
Uh, that sort of uh, brings me back to another uh, topic that I was wanting to talk about. Uh, how do I put this? Basically, I've been thinking about, in terms of sports and life in general, a concept of exploration versus goal setting, or maybe hard goal setting. Um, because, you know, people will tell you, you know, oh, you need to set, you know, goals that are smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, whatever. Um, but I've found for myself that, like, I never did that when I got into training. It's not like, oh, I want to squat. I know I want to get to a 315 squat by whatever and a five plate squat by whatever. Um, I just went into the gym every day and said, you know, let's see what we can do. Let's see. Let's see where we can take this thing. And I'm starting to think that it can be very limiting to try and set smart goals. Because it's like, okay you either see you you set a smart goal and then you say oh i'm four of six months in and i can still only squat 150 forget this you know it's dumb or you know oh i hit it i hit 315 at five months in instead well i guess i don't need to keep pushing it's like how much could you squat it if you kept going <laughs> like yeah yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, smart goals are really good for the fitness industry if you have a, a professional helping you so they can mm -hmm. help make it more more attainable, more realistic. Um, but you, you have an interesting point. I'm not sure. I, I've helped a lot of people with smart goals, but thinking about my own, like I just say I'm going to do this. And I do it. I don't really make a smart goal. So, you know, for a lot of people that um, – you're looking to reach out to and a lot of people who might be listening to some content like this later on um you know if you're if you're driven and you have that fire um you might be better off just taking every day and, and running with it um i think goals are important um but they can definitely inhibit um what you do and it actually makes me think back to uh when aj was at the gym um on on the same point he uh, highly, uh, he convinced me to put up a goal board, um, or sorry, a record board at the gym. And it was different because it was a CrossFit gym, right? So it wasn't like West Side. We didn't just have more numbers. But I wrote up a powerlifting section, Olympic lifting section, odd strength feats, some endurance feats, all this. And the point was, like, was it fair me being uh, an equipped lifter um, to put up my numbers in a powerlifting gym? No, they're not going to hit those. <laughs> but the purpose being... If a guy walked in and he had a, a 185 squat and his goal was 225 and he sees the other CrossFit coaches and they squat about 350, maybe 400 pounds for their same goal. Yeah, they're in freak nature shape. And then he saw me squatting 657. Now his two-plate goal isn't that strong in his mind. But if, if what he sees or she sees is coach – is the strongest dude in the gym is maybe between 350 and 500 pounds. That's strong. So you know what? 225 is good enough for me. I'm at 185. That's a good strength goal. Okay, I agree. But in the same sense, if you know, if it was at, uh, at my gym and you saw my name up on the board and you're like, wow, that smaller dude right there, because at the time I'm weighing like 175, walking at, they're like, that dude squats that. Yeah, in competition, there's the metal that backs it up. Now 225 isn't that much. So now maybe it helps them think 275 or 315. And that really registered when he said that. And so we put it up on the board and we ran it that way for years. And um, there were some numbers up there that, you know, the average crossfitter was not going to hit. Had some pros come in and, you know, doing 35 unbroken muscle ups and shit. The average crossfitter is not going to do that. But they wanted one. Now maybe they'll strive for five and do better. So I think a lot of times it's also environment when it's goal setting. You know, if you walk into a gym like ours, it might be easier for you to be like, well, I'm not sure what I want to squat yet because I just watched, you know, Chris squat a grand for three. So who knows what I'm capable of, but I'm going to get stronger. Yeah. That's where I think the problem is with goals is if they're, uh, they're limiting. And then when people finish them, it's like, well, now what? Well, what's the next goal? Are we just done because we achieved a goal? And what if we demolish that goal quicker than we thought? Yeah. Um. Yeah, that sort of ties into an uh, idea that interests me a lot 
is uh, a, a guy that I really respect who's an online, uh, well not online, he's uh, basically a self-help author. He says uh, one of his quote-unquote rules for life is don't compare yourself to others, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And it's like, and even that can be difficult sometimes because, you know, you'll feel like, oh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not as strong as I was yesterday because I broke this and broke that. But, you know, if you, if you look at it in a broad perspective, I mean, I'm not where I want to be right now. I'm, you know, still recovering, but I've, I've lost either 40 or 50 pounds since I started training, and I was at about 65% body fat, and so eventually I want to try and get down to 15% at some point to say I've lost 50% bo 50 body fat per percentage points in my life and that's you know there's no one you know I, I can't say oh I got the body fat percentage record whatever but it's like that's still gonna be very uh, impactful to me and I know that yeah. I'll get there I'm excited to see that day yeah it's hard though you know what you're talking about is um, I, I do, I'm pretty good at staying in my own lane. I don't really care what a lot of other people do, but I do, you know, if not, I wouldn't be motivated to have, you know, a nice car or, uh, or lift the weights that I did or, or other things like that. <clears throat> and I even said earlier, there's people I've unfollowed on social media for no other reason, because they're too damn strong and they're close to me. Like they're probably good people. I just don't like watching them because it makes me feel bad. Why am I not even close to that? Now, you're absolutely way stronger than most people, you know, some of these all-time world record holders, but it's like, dude, that's just, that's dumb. People don't move weight like that anywhere close to you. Yeah. It's not just like you're you're the best, you're demolishing everybody in our weight class. This isn't fair and I don't want to watch anymore. So yeah. I'm not that good at, uh, at just comparing myself to me yesterday. Um, and maybe part of that's male ego, I don't know, um, but... Uh, I, that kind of goes back to where when I was in a rough spot and I was really only focusing on me, but that's a different life and, and uh, with a lot less distractions. But at that point in time, all I wanted to do is a little bit better than the day before. And I already acknowledged I had worse days. Um, so it went downhill sometimes. Um, but, you know, you, you're battling with some injuries right now and, you know, on your, on your way back up for sure. Are you as strong as you used to be at your strongest? No. Are you stronger than where you started this journey? Yes. And you have two other pieces that are really key in there. Do you have more mental um, uh, knowledge than you did before on how to get there, how to maintain it? Yes. And are you building this incredible motivation and fire inside right now that uh, successful, strong people like we have? Yeah. So if you want to unleash that fire, we know one plus one equals two. Well, your one plus your one will equal two, and it'll be better than it was before. So yeah. that's always that motivating factor. I'm not where I was yesterday, but in a way, I'm still growing. I'm growing that energy, and I'm growing that uh, mental capacity. Yeah. Uh, there was one other topic I wanted to touch on before we called it, if you still have time. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I'm interested in your take on, let's call it, individualizing for individualizing coaching for athletes and your own training yeah um, for example you know there's you'll you'll try and coach someone and some people take for example cues uh, the stop the train cue is one that really uh, resonated with me but you know you say that to other people and they're like what does that even mean and it's like I think that's a very clear example of that, but to put it in a more granular perspective, even just the way that you frame training. You know, a 17-year-old a, a uh, lineman in an uh, excellent football program, you know, you're going to be like, let's fucking go, let's get some. But if you do that to, you know, 30-year-old soccer mom, that's going to be like, you're never going to see them again. <laughs> yep. Um, so I was just interested if you had any particular 
philosophies or like mental rules perhaps and rules might uh heuristics i guess in terms of how you individualize for people yeah that's a, a great topic i mean we could do probably a whole other discussion on this in the future um i i wish i had something more concrete um, when i get questions like this and this really makes me wish i had more and this is where i i get down on myself sometimes like yeah, if I just been a, been a, a, a good um, af or a good uh, good student and a, and a good uh, uh, you know son and, and and youth for that matter, I could have went to school and with my drive and things I'm interested in, if I had a master's degree and um, or you know a doctorate in like uh, sports psychology and really tied that into what we do, that could be some cool stuff. I wish, I wish. Well, I don't have. I wish, and I don't have time to wish. So I have what I have to work with, which is a lot of experience. Um, but it would be cool, you know, if I would have done a bunch of research on it and, and have a, a book written. Um, speaking of books, The uh, Conscious Coach um, is one that I've read lately that I really, really like. Um, I'll pull up the name of it here right yeah. right quick. Actually, why don't, why don't you just send me a link? Yep. I just want to make sure I got it right since we're, uh, we're chatting on here. Yeah. I'll pull up. Uh, I should have it in audio book. And... I have it over here on the shelf. Nope, must be at home. Uh, one that Duffin recommended to me, and I had um, I had read it before, um, but that's something uh, definitely more on the psychology side. But I like it because it's not just a psychology book, so it's just not you know all heady and things that we talk about. You can tell the guys coach people before and real people, um, and it's more not necessarily application, but um, and it works. It can work with you know life and uh and other things uh as well i uh, should i can't even find the uh the good old app yeah i'll send it to you i'm pretty sure it's a uh, the conscious coach um maybe you can put the link in if you pop this up on on youtube or whatever yeah. later but, yeah um that's a hard one and i think about you know what's successful i this is where i geek out on it and um maybe i should study a little bit more to support psychology i don't know if that would really interest me but it's almost to me it's the art side of things i'm you know me I'm, I'm super geeky like i think between our excel sheet and velocity and some good data we can master anybody um and and we have the science to do xyz and make you strong we make you move well science backs it up you've got good form we can do big things but how do i actually motivate you well you have to motivate yourself because i'm not going to come to your house and get you but when i interact with you i can motivate you um, and that's really, to me, that's the art side of things. Yeah. When we get into peaking um, and some other things that there's really not a lot of science on, that also kind of comes into the artsy side of coaching um, because it's an art. You, you have to understand and you have to go with the flow and it changes. Yeah. Um, you know, getting to handle um, Joe Sullivan, the first time I, I helped handle him at, um, um, gosh, I can't think of a, a boss of bosses. Um, I had talked to him a little bit before. I never met him in person. So I'm going to go handle one of our bigger athletes. Um, I've never met him before. And I don't know what he likes and doesn't like. Shit, better figure it out on the fly and be good. Um, handling the athletes at the Kern, handling the athletes international, um, getting to handle Chris um, through his last big strength feat. They're all completely different. Um, I have a client, um, um, you know, mid-70s. The way I handle her is completely different than the way I handle Charlie at a meet. Yeah. And they're both females. Um, completely different than the way that I handle you. Um, even though you lift similar to the way that I do, you like to get jacked up and go to a place and you like to lift. Um, handling you know, Coach Brandon would be different than if I'm handling Brady. And it's really, you have to be intuitive, but you have to be aware of what you're doing in your surroundings. I think most of that I got from my martial arts training. I have to be observant. How do you act? What do you listen to? What are you good at? What are you weak at? What do you need? And then it's kind of a feeling out process. And the best example I can give that is uh, is uh, handling Duffin. Um, and you know him too. He's a nice guy, um, a great person. Sometimes he isn't. <laughs> the way I would describe it is a lot of people have you know said, don't poke the bear. So when big guy's lifting, there's some certain rules that we don't do. But then when I got to handle him, I'm like, well, why fucking can't I? I'm the guy doing this. I'm going to say something if it's the right time. But I noticed I just said the right time. I'm not just going to say something to him. 
I'm going to feel, I'm not going to poke the bear, but I'm going to put my hand close to the cage and see if it's biting today. We really need to feel it out. What can I do? What can't I do? And not to sound too wooey, but it comes from more of my martial arts training. It's an energy thing. Yeah. I feel it more than I see it. My eyes, I feel, are deceptive because I'm like, oh, I can go talk to you in the middle of the set. And then I get close and I'm like, ooh, I don't like this energy. This is not vibing well. Or I start to say something and I get a good, a weird look. So, you know, it's a, we're, we're wrestling or grappling or doing push hands and things like that, talking martial arts. It's that give and flow, that ebb and take of energy. Do I have an opening? Can I go in? Do I need to turn and walk the other way? How do I handle it? So interestingly enough, like other than experience and putting yourself out there, I don't have a good answer because I think some sports psychology will help. You know, you can ask your athlete or your friend, you know, um, some some uh, personality assessment questions, and you can learn a lot about them. How do they thrive? What do they need? Where are their weaknesses? Where are their strengths? But at the at the end of the day, um, when when it comes to it, people change in the moment, especially under pressure. If they're having a good day on a meet, you can handle them completely different. What if they're a seasoned athlete and they've never had a bad meet, and this is their first meet and it's on an international stage? Good luck, go. Because that's a shitty day for both of you. And everything that worked before is now out the window. So go back to that flow. The only way I can say that that works is with a lot of experience. Um, but it really comes back to being um, observatory, you know, good observation. If you want, I don't know if that's the right word, but having a good observation for um, your, your athlete, yourself even, so you can tell your handlers what you need. Um, I've got that from you before. I don't need this now. Go leave me alone and do X. Yeah. Okay. I disagree with you, but now I know exactly what you want. Good enough. Yeah. Well, and that's, um, again, that comes back to the whole being your own hero thing is like, you know, sometimes athletes do know better than the coach about what they need. And it's, it's really hard because I find for myself personally, like, there's there's a noticeable difference between when someone says what they need and what they want. It's like, Oh, I, I don't want to do this today. It's like, well, that fucking sucks. Get after it. Yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes it's like, I need to not do this today. And it's like, I don't see that super clearly, but I believe you. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, I'll give you a funny story on this note. <clears throat> so, you know, again, we'll, we'll go from handling duff into, um, you know, trying to figure out when and where I can say something. If it's a good day, you know, do I give a little positive feedback? If we're having an off day, and you know, an off day for Chris is a half inch out of position, which makes a mile of difference lifting weights that nobody's lifted before. Yeah. Um, do I bring up what I noticed? Do I do it now on the fly so we can correct it? Do I do it after the session? And I just got to feel that out. And I got to go by experience and, and hope and wish a little bit that this is the right decision. So a very cautious approach, right, with, with the big bear. Um, I've got uh, the same lifter I talked about before. I've had the chance to, to coach her multiple times at Worlds. And one of my favorite coaching stories, the sound, I laugh already because I swear this is going to make me sound like a horrible coach. And the people that saw it from the side are probably like, that dude is a dick. <laughs> um, she is absolutely one of the, uh, the most friendly people I've ever known. Is fairly fluent in multiple languages. Um, so... We're at uh, APF WPC Worlds in Florida, and you know we were there uh, representing Team US, and it was the coolest experience I've had uh, nationally um, because there was only X, I think three people, three Americans from each weight class and division allowed on the team, and so there was more international people and teams. Um, you know, I've been to different world uh, meets where there was definitely American dominant, and I felt like it was you know just another meet in, in Vegas or. Even in Ireland, it was... Yeah, I mean, we, we did. In Ireland, we rolled deep. Team America, I mean, in, in Ireland, you know, they're pretty much, in my book, I hope they don't offend my uh, Irish friends in this, but they're pretty much American to me. You know, uh, their, their accent's different, but we like our whiskey, we like to hang out, we like to lift, we look the same, we talk the same. You know, it's, it's fairly similar. We get along really well. Um, but, you know, there's guys from Kenya, guys from France, Germany, like, I can't speak those languages. And yeah. she's chatting up half these people. And she's a very friendly lifter, and that's part of why she likes to lift. You know, it's, it gets her out at her age, and she meets people and has this awesome experience. But we got to focus right now. We're breaking world records. And I would tell her, like, okay, go to the bathroom between your attempts. Come back here and find me. 
and I'm watching the clock like you guys have all seen me do, and I'm like, man, man, we're like four out. Where is she? I'm going yeah. in the women's bathroom right now to drag her <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah. And, you know, people are going to think I'm abusing my grandma. But uh, I'd see her, and she'd go happy. Oh, my God, I just met this lady, and she's from France, and I was talking to her about – I'm like, hey, we're uh, two minutes out. We're going to wrap your knees now. Yeah. And so I got frustrated afterwards a couple of times. And, you know, I let her have some of that because it doesn't make her anxiety between. But, again, it's that ebb and flow. Like, I need you to think about something else, but then I need you to bring it back when it's time to. And I, I found her one. I told her to, to go have a seat. And uh, I found her in the hall meeting somebody from, you know, Germany now, talking to this female 60-year-old Jack lady from Germany, bench press champion, and they're talking about, you know, bench and it's deadlifts. And I grab her, I'm like, I take her, I grab a chair in the warm-up room, and I take her over to the corner of the room, and I face the chair to the corner of the room, and I told her to sit in the chair, don't talk to anybody, I'd be back, and uh, left her there facing the corner of the room. <laughs> you put her in and time out. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm a dick. But that's what I needed to do to keep my athlete focused. Now, everybody walking... Uh, by probably see me grab my athlete, looks like my grandma, drag her over to the corner of the room, put her in a chair, make her face the wall, and tell her not to talk to anybody. <laughs> if they know me, they've seen me at Worlds, you know, in a multi ply suit, in the corner of the room, in a chair, staring at the wall, talking to it, having a very bad discussion with the wall like it stole my money. <laughs> so that's all I could think about in the time, but nobody talked to her when I left her in the corner, and um, we hit our biggest deadlift of all time, so... Hey, it worked. So, yeah. But it's uh, like, you got to figure it out on the fly. What are we going to do here? Um, but yeah, that'll be one of my favorite stories forever. I put grandma on the corner. <laughs> I still feel bad about it, except she won and hit a bigger deadlift than she knew she could even pick up. So, yeah. And then we got to be friends with everybody after the meeting. Nice. And I, I think, um, I think one of the most underrated, perhaps, skills in powerlifting is focus. Because yeah. it's like, You'll see people walk up on the platform, and it's like they're they're obviously super amped up and emotional and whatever, but they're not doing anything. Nothing's clicking. It's just they're just out there to explode. It's like, yeah, I've been more focused before on getting jacked up and being in the moment than I am actually lifting weight, and it's cost me big lifts. Yeah, multiple times. Yeah, deadlift is my best example of that. I'm more focused, if I think about it uh, after the fact now, I'm more focused on getting jacked for that big pull than I am actually executing the big pull. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, um, it's an interesting thing because I think it's so hard to train in the moment, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent just thinking about focusing under the bar just totally outside of the gym yep and it's funny because you know people watch me lift and you're like wow he's so emotional or 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 focused or excited or not not focused excited or whatever and for me it's like that's just like a a physical expression or yeah a physical expression of the energy that I have like I'm not super emotional and excited I mean you you know you've seen at worlds that before I head out there I definitely get pretty emotional but it's like once I'm there it's just pure focus and energy yeah one of the hard things uh, we will we'll relate this to fighting um, uh, lifting is, is fairly similar like you can't always be peaked and you definitely can't hit your maxes every day so everything else has to be submax. So you can be super calm and collected at 50%. But when you put on a weight you've never walked out before and walk out with it, to practice staying focused in that moment is hard because you can only be in that moment two to four times a year. Yeah, it's the same for thing like fire. 10 seconds. You can be in that moment for yeah. 40 seconds a year. <laughs> you, can, you can have a fighter who is super calm, cool, collected in the gym, but on their UFC debut, even though they're already a top pro champion, they have, you know, butterflies and ring rust, and they've got 20 pro fights under their belt. Um, and even that, like, to say, you know, if you're fighting four times a year, well, how do you get better at that? You can't fight 10 times a year in the octagon. You'll be broken. You'll have no time training. Yeah. Um, so both of those sports are hard to practice in the moment because 
they're so, uh, you know, it can take football too. And there's so much stress on the body, it's hard to train at that level. So, uh, you know, you do some of the right things focusing outside of the time. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It is hard too. Well, and one of the things that I've found the most useful actually is uh, Brady saw me training one day. And I've, I haven't been focused like this the entire time that I've been training. And I think this was even before you even started coaching me. Um, but Brady saw me training one day and he's like, dude, you need to just calm down. And so he, <laughs> <laughs> he recommended a, uh, uh, meditation app. It's called Headspace. I don't actually use it anymore. I, I've stopped really using apps for it, but just, and I did it. They, they have a little, uh, tracker X days in a row and I did it for 365 days in a row in a row. And actually I hit that 365 days in Ireland, which is kind of funny. Nice. Um, but the amount that I gained in terms of not just like mental health, but also just the ability to focus was so, so intense and voluminous. Vol there was so much volume to it that I, I just can't recommend that enough to anyone. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. I used to meditate a lot more than I do now. It's one of my goals is to, uh, to pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Most powerful tool we have. Yep. Computer upstairs. Yes, sir. Alrighty. Well, this has been great, my friend. I hope to have another episode with you. Hopefully before, I, I'd like to have another episode with you before the 100 episode mark. But well, Remember, I get the 100 spot too, so that yes, means sir. I get three. Yeah. I get three in the top 100. Exactly. I... Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing this more. And if you have anybody that you think would be good to have on, I would definitely be interested in yeah. hearing that. Yeah, I'll give you a, a list um, in uh, in person. Um, and some of those probably will springboard off into uh, to other things. So, awesome. Um, I like it. Um, I actually had a good time and uh, got some good stuff out of it. So uh, awesome. thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for being on. You bet. And that is the end of the road.